These are the answers to the AP Chemistry packet on topics 2.5 to 2.7. This is MCQ practice, which means these are multiple choice questions for you to practice so you can prepare for the AP Chemistry exam. In the video description area, there is a link to the packet that accompanies this video. Now, let's take a look at our first multiple choice question. Question one says, which of the following is a valid Lewis diagram for the molecule C3H6? So the first thing I'm going to do is to count the total number of valence electrons that should be present in this Lewis diagram. So each carbon atom has four valence electrons, and there are three carbon atoms in this formula, so four times three is 12. Each hydrogen atom has one valence electron, and there are six hydrogen atoms, so 12 plus 6 is 18. Now I'll take a look at choice A, and I'll count the total number of valence electrons that were used to create that Lewis diagram. So in choice A, I see 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So choice A can be eliminated because they used too many valence electrons to create that Lewis diagram. Now, moving on to choices B and C, what I'm looking for would be a violation of the octet rule, which would be either less than an octet or more than an octet around a particular atom. And so in choice B, I can see at least one carbon atom that has a violation of the octet rule. So I can eliminate choice B because that carbon atom on the left has more than an octet around it. Similarly, I can see another violation of the octet rule in choice C. So that central carbon atom has more than an octet around it. So the reason why the correct answer to question one is choice D, if I count the total number of valence electrons that were used to create that Lewis diagram, I see 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So it does have the proper number of valence electrons total, and there are no violations of the octet rule for any of those carbon atoms. So again, the answer to question one is choice D. Now let's take a look at question two. Question two says which of the following is a valid Lewis diagram for the polyatomic ion NO2 plus. So the strategy for answering question two is very similar to the strategy that we used to answer question one. We'll need to make sure that the correct answer has the proper number of total valence electrons and that there are no violations of the octet rule for any of the atoms. But the slight difference between question one and question two is that here in question two, we actually have a polyatomic ion as opposed to a molecule. So what we need to do with respect to a polyatomic ion is consider the charge. If we had a charge of negative one, then we would add one more electron to our total. But since we have a charge of positive one, it means we actually remove an electron from our total. So Nitrogen has five valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons. So five plus six times two, because we have two oxygen atoms, would be a total of 17. And since we have a positive one charge, we take away one of those electrons from the total. So the correct number of valence electrons that there should be for the NO2 plus Lewis diagram is 16. So I'll start with choice A. In choice A, if I count, I do see a total of 16 valence electrons that were used to create that Lewis diagram, but there is a obvious problem, and that's that central atom. So I see less than an octet around that central nitrogen atom, so we can eliminate choice A. Now let me take a look at choice C. Again, we see a problem with that central atom in that there is less than an octet around that central nitrogen atom, so we can eliminate choice C. 
Now let's take a look at choice D. If I count the total number of valence electrons that were used to create that diagram, I see 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So the problem with choice D is that they did not use 16 valence electrons, they used 18 valence electrons. Now if you look back at choice C, which we've already eliminated, if you count, they actually also did use an improper number of valence electrons in choice C. So another reason to eliminate choice C. So now that we've eliminated choices A, C, and D, let's take a closer look at why the correct answer to question two is choice B. If we count the number of valence electrons, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, we can see 16 valence electrons total. And if you look closely, there are no violations of the octet rule for any of those atoms. So the correct answer to question two is choice B. Now let's take a look at question three. Question three says, based on formal charges, which of the following Lewis diagrams is the best representation of the bonding in the molecule NOCl. So if we count the total number of valence electrons for the molecule NOCl, that would be five for nitrogen, plus six for oxygen, plus seven for chlorine, and that's a grand total of 18 valence electrons. And if we look carefully at all four of these Lewis diagrams in question three, we notice that each of these Lewis diagrams contains 18 valence electrons, which is the proper number. And if we look closely at the individual atoms and try to find any violations of the octet rule, there are none. So each of these four Lewis diagrams is valid, that is, no octet rule violations. So it does say based on formal charges. Formal charges is a topic that appears in topic 2.6 in the AP Chemistry course and exam description. So what I'm highlighting on this slide is the fact that it says the octet rule and formal charge can be used as criteria for determining which of several possible valid Lewis diagrams provides the best model for predicting molecular structure and properties. So in an earlier video, when I was teaching about topic 2.6, I had presented this information about formal charge. Formal charge is a bookkeeping system used to analyze Lewis structures. Formal charges are not actual charges in a molecule or ion. Instead, they are formally assigned to each atom in a Lewis structure according to the following equation. The formal charge of an atom is equal to the number of valence electrons that that atom has minus the number of electrons that are assigned to that atom in the Lewis structure. So the number of electrons that are assigned to an atom in a Lewis structure is equal to the sum of the covalent bonds drawn to the atom plus the number of non-bonding electrons on that atom. So the way that I normally teach how to assign formal charges is I think of it as valence electrons minus the sum of the dots and the bonds. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Lewis diagrams for question three. So starting with choice A, oxygen has six valence electrons and around that particular atom in choice A, I see four dots and two bonds. Therefore, the formal charge would be six minus six or zero. Now chlorine has seven valence electrons and around that particular atom in choice A, I see two dots and three bonds. So seven minus five would be a formal charge of positive two. And then nitrogen has five valence electrons and around that particular atom in choice A, I see six dots and one bond. So it's going to be five minus seven, which is a formal charge of negative two. I'll use the same procedure to analyze the formal charges for choices B, C, and D. So moving on to choice B, 
Oxygen has six valence electrons. I see six dots and one bond. So six minus seven is negative one. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. I see two dots and three bonds. So seven minus five is positive two. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. I see four dots and two bonds, so five minus six is negative one. I'm going to move on to choice D. So I see oxygen with six valence electrons, six dots and one bond, six minus seven is negative one. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. I see two dots and three bonds, five minus five is zero. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. I see four dots and two bonds. Seven minus six is positive one. Now, if you're really good at assigning formal charges to atoms, then you already know why I saved the Lewis diagram in choice C for last. Take a look. Six valence electrons for oxygen, four dots and two bonds. Six minus six is zero. Five valence electrons for nitrogen, two dots and three bonds. Five minus five is zero. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. I see six dots and one bond. Seven minus seven is zero. So when I taught the rules for assigning formal charges, I also presented some guidelines. And one of the guidelines says that the dominant or the most preferred Lewis structure is the one in which the atoms have formal charges that are closest to zero. Now, there is another rule that talks about electronegativity, which we're going to see in the next question, in question four. But for right now, we can answer question three just looking at that first rule, which is based on the fact that the dominant Lewis structure is the one in which atoms have formal charges that are closest to zero, that makes choice C the correct answer to question three. Now, let's take a look at question four. Question four says two proposed Lewis diagrams for the cyanate ion, which is OCN minus, are shown above. Which of the following indicates the more favorable representation of the bonding in the cyanate ion and provides the correct justification? So we'll go ahead and we'll assign formal charges to each of the atoms in each of these Lewis diagrams. So starting with diagram number one, Oxygen has six valence electrons, and in that diagram, I see six dots and one bond, so six minus seven is negative one. Carbon has four valence electrons, and I see four bonds, but that's it, there's no dots, so four minus four is zero. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, and I see two dots and three bonds, so five minus five is zero. Now, it turns out that the sum of the formal charges in a molecule would normally be equal to zero because a molecule does not have an overall charge. But this is a polyatomic ion, and the overall charge on that polyatomic ion happens to be negative one. So in this case, the sum of the formal charges in these Lewis structures is going to be equal to the overall charge of the ion, which is negative one. So it's impossible to get a formal charge of zero on each of the atoms in these Lewis diagrams. All right, let's go ahead and move on to diagram two. Oxygen has six valence electrons, and I see four dots and two bonds. So six minus six is zero. Carbon has four valence electrons, and I just see four bonds, and that's it. So four minus four is zero. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, and I see four dots and two bonds, so five minus six is negative one. So now, what we need to do in order to determine which one of these Lewis diagrams is more favorable or dominant or preferred is take a look at that second guideline for formal charges that I had mentioned earlier. It has to do with electronegativity. So take a look. It's highlighted on this slide. It says, if a Lewis structure contains a negative formal charge, the dominant Lewis structure is the one in which the negative formal charge is assigned to the more electronegative atom. Now, we have in diagram one a formal charge of negative one on oxygen. And in diagram two, we have a formal charge of negative one on nitrogen. The general trend 
on the periodic table with respect to electronegativity is that electronegativity tends to increase as you move from left to right across a period. So oxygen being further to the right than nitrogen is more electronegative. So the preferred diagram is diagram number one. So the answer to question four is choice B. Diagram number one is the more favorable representation because it places the negative formal charge on oxygen, which is the most electronegative atom. Now, let's take a look at question five. Question five says the connectivity between the oxygen atoms in the O3, or the ozone molecule, is shown in the diagram above. Which of the following best describes the electron arrangement in the ozone molecule and the bond orders of the two oxygen-oxygen bonds? So the first thing I have to do is complete this Lewis diagram. Right now, I just see the connectivity between the three oxygen atoms, but I have to count how many total valence electrons should there be in the Lewis diagram. And since oxygen has six valence electrons, and there are three oxygen atoms, six times three is 18. So now what I'm gonna do is add lone pairs of electrons, and I'll start with the oxygen on the far left. So I'll add one, two, three lone pairs of electrons on that oxygen atom in order to complete the octet for that atom, and I'll do the same thing on the other side. So here's three more pairs of valence electrons. Now let's see what my grand total is so far. So right now I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 valence electrons that I have used so far to make this Lewis diagram. And once I put a lone pair of electrons on that central oxygen atom, I have now officially run out of valence electrons that I can use to create this Lewis diagram. And hopefully you can see that the central oxygen atom has less than an octet, but I can't add any more electrons to this total because I've already reached the total of 18. So what I can do to finish this Lewis diagram and give that central atom access to a complete octet is I can create a double bond. And so what I'll do is I'll move a pair of electrons from the oxygen atom on the left to create a double bond. Now, what you might be thinking is, couldn't you have moved a pair of electrons from the oxygen atom on the other side or on the right side of the molecule? And the answer is yes. And so now we come to a situation which falls under topic 2.6. I've already talked about formal charge. So another topic included in topic 2.6 is resonance. So I'll highlight that first bullet point on this slide from the essential knowledge statements from the AP Chemistry course and exam description. So it says, in cases where more than one equivalent Lewis structure can be constructed, resonance must be included as a refinement to the Lewis structure. In many such cases, this refinement is needed to provide qualitatively accurate predictions of molecular structure and properties. So at the bottom of this slide, is information that I had presented in an earlier video when I was talking about topic 2.6. So it says the two structures of the ozone or O3 molecule shown above illustrate the concept of resonance. The bonding in the ozone molecule cannot be represented with a single Lewis structure. Resonance structures exist when there is the same arrangement of atoms in other words, the same connectivity between the atoms, but a different arrangement of the bonding and non-bonding electrons. Here's some more information about resonance and then this specific example of ozone or O3. When more than one resonance structure can be drawn for a substance, the actual structure is considered to be a hybrid or an average of the resonance structures. The electrons are said to be delocalized or spread out instead of being localized in a particular bond. Even though 
a double-headed arrow is drawn in between the resonance structures. The Lewis structures are not being interconverted back and forth. Instead, the actual structure is a hybrid or an average of the Lewis structures. Now, with respect to bond order, if we just look at one of these Lewis diagrams, you might think that there is a double bond and a single bond. But it turns out that the bond order of the oxygen-oxygen bonds in ozone, again, because of resonance, is equal to 1.5. And this value represents an average of a single bond with a bond order of one and a double bond with a bond order of two. So those two bonds are equivalent to each other and they have a bond order of 1.5. So now we have enough information to come up with the correct answer to question five. The correct answer is choice D. In terms of the electron arrangement, ozone can be described as an average of two equivalent Lewis structures. And in terms of the bond orders of the two oxygen-oxygen bonds, they each have a bond order of 1.5. Now, let's take a look at question six. Question six says the two carbon-oxygen bonds in the acetate ion have the same length. Which of the following sets of Lewis diagrams best supports the explanation for this observation? So the chemical formula of the acetate ion is C2H3O2, and it has an overall charge of negative one. Let's go ahead and count the total number of valence electrons that should be used to build the Lewis diagram for the acetate ion. Each carbon atom has four valence electrons, and we have two of them. Each hydrogen atom has one valence electron, and we have three hydrogen atoms, and each oxygen atom has six valence electrons, and we have two of those. So four times two plus one times three plus six times two would give us a total of 23 valence electrons. But because this is a polyatomic ion, which has an overall charge of negative one, that negative one charge means we're gonna add one more electron to our total. So the total number of valence electrons is not 23, but rather 24. And so when we look at each of these Lewis diagrams in choices A, B, C, and D, and we do the counting of the valence electrons, we discover that they all contain exactly 24 valence electrons. Now, in a similar way to question five, this question does deal with the concept of resonance so what I'd like to show you is an example of what resonance is as well as what it is not. So take a look at these two molecules. These two molecules have the chemical formula C2H6O, but the molecule on the left has a carbon bonded to a carbon bonded to an oxygen, and the molecule on the right has a carbon bonded to an oxygen and then bonded to a carbon. So while they have the same chemical formula, they have a different connectivity between the atoms. They have a different arrangement of the atoms. So these two Lewis structures do not represent examples of resonance. Now let's take a look at these two Lewis diagrams and the chemical formula of sulfur dioxide is SO2. Same arrangement of atoms, same connectivity between the atoms, but a different arrangement of the electrons. So the SO2 molecule can be represented with two equivalent resonance structures. So the reason I mentioned that example of C2H6O that was not an example of resonance is take a closer look at choice A in question six. So that first Lewis diagram in choice A has a carbon bonded to three hydrogen atoms. And on the other side of that same choice A, the other Lewis diagram, the carbon is only bonded to two hydrogen atoms. That third hydrogen atom is actually bonded to oxygen on the other side of the Lewis diagram. So the reason why I'm gonna get rid of choice A and eliminate that as a possibility is we're looking for examples of two equivalent resonance structures. That will help explain why the two carbon-oxygen bonds in the acetate ion 
have the same length. So because I'm looking for two equivalent resonance structures, and in choice A, there's a different arrangement of the atoms, those are not examples of resonance, so I'm going to eliminate choice A. Now what I'm looking for to help me eliminate other possible wrong answers would be if I see any violations of the octet rule. So a violation of the octet rule could be less than an octet around an atom or more than an octet around an atom. So looking at choice B, I see that that Lewis diagram is a violation of the octet rule with less than an octet. And then the other diagram has more than an octet. So we'll go ahead and eliminate choice B. Now, moving on to choice C. Again, they have the same connectivity between the atoms, but I see a violation of the octet rule in that Lewis diagram on the right-hand side. So more than an octet. I see another violation where there's less than an octet. So we can eliminate choice C because it doesn't have valid Lewis diagrams. So why is the correct answer to question six, choice D? Same arrangement of atoms, in other words, the same connectivity between the atoms. But as you can see, as I've highlighted, one of the arrangements involves a double bond to oxygen and a single bond, and then those are just a different arrangement of the electrons. So the actual structure of the acetate ion is considered to be a hybrid or an average of these two resonance structures. So that would explain why the two carbon-oxygen bonds in the acetate ion have the same length. Now, let's take a look at question seven. Question seven says, which of the following Lewis electron dot diagrams represents the molecule that contains the smallest bond angle? And since we're talking about molecular geometry, and bond angles, this would fall under topic 2.7 in the AP Chemistry course and exam description. Topic 2.7 is VSEPR and bond hybridization. So here are some highlighted information from the essential knowledge statements. VSEPR is an acronym that stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion. So VSEPR theory uses the Coulombic repulsion between electrons as a basis for predicting the arrangement of electron pairs around a central atom. And both Lewis diagrams and VSEPR theory must be used for predicting electronic and structural properties of many covalently bonded molecules and polyatomic ions, including the following, molecular geometry and bond angles. Now, on this next slide, this is something that I had presented in my earlier video when I was talking about topic 2.7. And you can see on this slide that I have different molecular geometries, such as linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral. And then underneath those shapes, I have the bond angle. So linear, 180 degrees, trigonal planar, 120 degrees tetrahedral, 109.5 degrees. Now, when you have a lone pair or a non-bonding pair of electrons on the central atom, then that can affect the bond angle. So on this slide, you can see two different Lewis diagrams. On the left, we have the BF3 molecule, which has trigonal planar geometry and a bond angle of 120 degrees. But the non-bonding pair or the lone pair of electrons on that central atom in the ozone or the O3 molecule, that causes greater repulsion. And those greater repulsive forces on the nearby bonding pairs reduces the bond angle from being not 120, but slightly less than that, or 117 degrees. Another slide that I'm showing you here before I get to the answer to this question also came from my earlier video where I talked about topic 2.7. Take a look at these bond angles for H2O, which is approximately 105, NH3, which is approximately 107, and then CH4, which has the standard tetrahedral bond angle of 109.5. So why are the bond angles in H2O and NH3 slightly less 
than 109.5, well, hopefully you can see that on that central atom in NH3, there's a lone pair of electrons. And on H2O, there are two lone pairs of electrons. And again, the greater repulsive forces of those lone pairs of electrons are going to slightly decrease the bond angle. So now let's go ahead and answer question seven. Remember, what we're looking for in question seven is the smallest bond angle. I'll start with choice A, which is CF4. It's going to have tetrahedral geometry and a bond angle of 109.5. Now I'm going to move on to choice C. And that molecule, the SO3, is going to have trigonal planar geometry with a bond angle of 120 degrees. Now, the two remaining choices, there's at least one lone pair of electrons on that central atom, and that's going to slightly decrease the expected bond angle. So for choice D, I can see three electron domains on that central atom, but the bond angle would be slightly less than 120 degrees. And now we come to choice B, the NF3 molecule. Again, the bond angle in NF3 is not going to be exactly 109.5. Because of that lone pair of electrons on the central nitrogen atom, which exerts slightly greater repulsive forces on the nearby bonding pairs of electrons, the bond angle in NF3 would be slightly less than 109.5. So hopefully now you can see why the correct answer to question seven would be choice B, Again, we're looking for the molecule that contains the smallest bond angle. Now, let's take a look at question eight. Question eight says the BF3 molecule is nonpolar, whereas the NF3 molecule is polar. Which of the following statements accounts for the difference in polarity of the two molecules? So in order to answer, Question eight, this also falls under the topic of 2.7 VS EPR and bond hybridization. And we're focusing on the presence of a dipole moment. So what you can see on this slide is information that I had presented in my earlier video for topic 2.7. So I'm gonna highlight on this slide, it says, if all of the bond dipoles cancel each other out, the molecule is classified as nonpolar. So the BF3 molecule with its trigonal planar geometry, it has three polar BF bonds, but because they are arranged symmetrically in that trigonal planar geometry, all of the bond dipoles in BF3 cancel each other out. So the molecule is classified as nonpolar. But the other molecule that's on this slide, which is NH3, it has trigonal pyramidal geometry, not trigonal planar, but trigonal pyramidal. So those polar NH bonds are not arranged symmetrically in such a way that they will cancel each other out. So when the bond dipoles do not cancel each other out, then the molecule is classified as polar. So BF3, bond dipoles cancel each other out, molecule is nonpolar. NH3, Trigonal pyramidal, the bond dipoles do not cancel each other out, it is polar. Now in this example, in question eight, we're comparing BF3 with NF3, a very similar molecule to the NH3 that I had just shown you on the previous slide. So here is BF3 with its total of 24 valence electrons. It has trigonal planar geometry, whereas NF3, with its 26 electrons, has trigonal pyramidal geometry. So for the BF3, with its trigonal planar geometry, all of the bond dipoles cancel out. So BF3 is nonpolar. But for NF3, its trigonal pyramidal, the bond dipoles do not cancel each other out. That molecule is polar. Now we do have four choices in question eight. Let's go ahead and see why the correct answer to question eight turns out to be choice D. So the reason why it's not choice A is because it said that the NF3 molecule consists of NF double bonds, and that's simply not true. We're not comparing double bonds with single bonds. 
And the problem with choice B, it says that the NF bonds are polar, which is true, whereas the BF bonds are nonpolar. And that's not true. A BF bond is in fact polar because of the difference in electronegativity between boron and fluorine. So both molecules contain polar bonds. It has to do with the arrangement of those bond dipoles in three-dimensional space. Now, choice C talks about one of them being ionic and the other being molecular. These are both covalent bonds and molecular compounds. So again, the correct answer is choice D. It's about the difference in geometry. So unlike BF3, which is trigonal planar, NF3, which is trigonal pyramidal, has non-planar geometry due to an unshared pair of electrons on the nitrogen atom. And again, with NF3, the bond dipoles do not cancel out, so that molecule is classified as polar. Again, correct answer for question eight is choice D. Now, let's take a look at question nine. Question nine says, which of the following indicates the correct molecular geometry and polarity for the molecule chlorine trifluoride, or ClF3? So the first thing I'm going to do is count the correct number of valence electrons that I need to create the Lewis diagram for this molecule. So chlorine has seven valence electrons, and fluorine also has seven valence electrons. So seven plus seven times three is a total of 28 valence electrons. And as far as the connectivity between the atoms, there's going to be a central chlorine atom that's bonded to three fluorine atoms in this molecule. So now what I'll do is put lone pairs of electrons around each of the fluorine atoms to complete the octet for each fluorine atom. And so at this point, once I've done that, I have now used up exactly 24 valence electrons. And I have to put the remaining four electrons on the central atom in the form of two lone pairs or non-bonding pairs of electrons. Now, when you look at that Lewis diagram, you recognize that that chlorine atom does represent a violation of the octet rule because there's more than an octet. But some molecules are simply an exception to the octet rule. Some molecules and ions like sulfur hexafluoride, SF6, or phosphorus pentafluoride, PF5, are examples of what are called hypervalent molecules. And so the Lewis structures of hypervalent molecules or polyatomic ions, they do represent exceptions to the octet rule. Now, back to the ClF3 molecule. Because of the presence of those lone pairs of electrons on the central chlorine atom, the molecular geometry will not be trigonal planar. It's going to be T-shaped. So we know that that's T-shaped geometry, so the answer is either A or B. And with respect to the bond dipoles in this T-shaped molecule, they're not arranged symmetrically 120 degrees apart like they would be in a trigonal planar molecule. So this molecule is polar because the bond dipoles in this T-shaped molecule, they do not cancel each other out. So the correct answer for question nine is A, the molecular geometry is T-shaped and the molecule is classified as polar because the bond dipoles do not cancel out. Now let's take a look at question 10. Question 10 says, in the reaction represented by the equation above, which of the following correctly identifies the hybridization of the carbon atoms before and after the reaction occurs? Now, this topic of hybridization also falls under topic 2.7. And so what you're seeing on this slide is something I had presented in an earlier video when I was talking about hybridization in topic 2.7. It says, in order to explain how the atomic orbital for an atom forms chemical bonds to create molecules with certain molecular shapes, we assume that the atomic orbitals on an atom undergo a mixing process that is known as hybridization. And the three types of hybrid orbitals are summarized in the table below. 
So the hybridization can be labeled as SP, SP2, or SP3. And it has to do with the total number of electron domains around the central atom. And that would be either two electron domains, or SP, three electron domains, SP2, four electron domains, SP3. Now, before we go back to question 10 in the packet, take a look at a few examples. Again, this was what I had presented in an earlier video for topic 2.7. So I have CO2, or carbon dioxide. When I draw the Lewis diagram for carbon dioxide, it looks like this, with a central atom, and there are two double bonds. You might not know whether to count those bonds as individual or as one group. So I'm drawing these little yellow ovals around the central atom, and that represents two electron domains. So on this slide, I'm defining what an electron domain actually is. An electron domain refers to a bond which could be either single, double, or triple, or a lone pair of electrons. So a single bond or a multiple bond counts as one electron domain, and a lone pair or a non-bonding pair of electrons would also count as one electron domain. So that central carbon atom has only two total electron domains and would be classified as sp. Here's another example, a little bit later in the packet that I had presented for topic 2.7. Here's the NO3 minus, or the nitrate ion. So here is the Lewis diagram, one of the possible resonance structures for the nitrate ion. And you can see that we have a total of three electron domains. So in that Lewis diagram, the double bond is not counted twice. There's a total of three electron domains around that central atom, which would mean that the central atom in the nitrate ion has sp2 hybridization. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the details of the carbon atoms both before the reaction and after the reaction. So according to this chemical equation, we start with a molecule C2H2. So looking at each carbon atom, I see a single bond and a triple bond, but that's still going to be two electron domains. So each carbon atom is surrounded by two electron domains and would be sp hybridization. So we can already narrow down the choices in question 10. The answer is either A or B. Now looking on the right side of the equation, so after the reaction occurs, each of those carbon atoms has a total of three electron domains, and so that would be sp2 hybridization. So the correct answer, based on our understanding of electron domains and hybridization, for question 10, the correct answer is A. Before the reaction, each carbon atom has two electron domains, so sp. After the reaction, each carbon atom has three electron domains, sp2. So question 10 is the last question in this packet. I hope that you found all of these answers and explanations helpful. Thanks for watching.